Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's two o'clock on a given Wednesday. And we have Louise Ng with us, and we are so happy and proud and just ecstatic that she's with us. Welcome to the show, Louise. Thank you, Jay. Louise is a labor and um, employment law litigator person uh, and a partner at Denton's, uh, the, uh, the successor to uh, Alston Hunt here in Honolulu. And uh, she's been giving lectures all over town about the subject. So we are happy to be able to tap into her, her knowledge. And the subject is, what is this step? The law of COVID comes to the workplace and it is changing the workplace. And so we wanted to ask Louise about that. I guess the first part, the first part, Louise, uh, is to talk about uh, the CARES Act and all those benefits that we were supposed to see and, and you know, what the status of them was. And I wanted to ask you about mm, uh, how we were doing on that. Uh, so the first one that comes to mind, let me get my notes up. The first one that comes to mind is, um, uh, the CARES Act itself, uh, 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 $2.3 I personally have not seen any of that, uh, although a lot of people have and some of them shouldn't have. Can you, can you give us a snapshot of how that act is doing? Well, that, that's the uh, CARES Act and the benefits under it is probably the current hot topic these days, other than what's happening with stay-at-home orders. And that's because we're in the middle of uh, the second round of Paycheck Protection Program funding. And that's the uh, really big program that um, probably every, a lot of people have been hearing about for small businesses of 500 employees or less. And there's other, um, other rules. But it basically is a program to encourage employers to retain employees, not to put them on furlough or fire them. And it, involve, it also entails a, uh, a loan forgiveness uh, uh, component as long as the employer is eligible. So right now the banks and potential borrowers are very, very busy either having applied for and gotten their loans or in the process of applying because the word is the money's gonna run out this week. Um, and then the next stage is just for those who have qualified or, or received their loans, um, because the regulations keep evolving, are they still eligible? So we've started to uh, confer with clients on that whole issue of eligibility. You know, Secretary Mnuchin's talked about having increased scrutiny of really big loans and eligibility issues. So that's the next thing that people are looking at. Does CARES Act cover uh, some of these really, really big loans, uh, bailout loans? For example, the administration was going to give big money to the airlines, uh, but it, it tried to condition uh, those funds on taking stock back in the airlines. The airlines gave pushback on that, and that didn't happen. Now there's talk about the administration trying to do that with utility companies in the same way, and I imagine there'll be pushback there too. Is that part of the CARES Act? Yes, it is part of the CARES Act. The CARES Act has a lot of different sections, and one of them is does involve um, financial help to the airlines. Um, and so I think a number of airlines have already received large loans, not probably not enough to cover their losses. Um, and then there's other programs as well. There, going to, there is a program, uh, the Main Street Lending Program is one that's in the process of being rolled out. Um, there's one for specific industries and uh, other specific industries. And uh, there are for some of these other programs, um, you know, some conditions that may not make it attractive to businesses, such as what you, what you mentioned, as well as, um, you know, that you, uh, I think there's, there's things about union organizing and, and, and the like. Mm, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's like the old Oklahoma land rush in some ways. Uh, as you say, the regulations are evolving, and that's not necessarily a good, a good word when you have short deadlines, evolving regulations, but short deadlines. Uh, and then, of course, the Lakers, you know, the Lakers call it the Lakers phenomenon. Uh, how in the world did that happen? Is there, is there no structure in this legislation that would prevent um, what happened in the Lakers case? Yeah, well, you know, and I think of the Shake Shack case, too. Yes. Um, not sure how the, you know, probably for some of these teams and the like, the way they qualified is they were under 500 employees. And in the case of uh, companies we, that were in the news like Roots, Chris, and Shake Shack, 
the way they qualified is that for certain businesses, hospitality, restaurant, and food service, food service being like, you know, the, pla the places that service universities and the like, they, uh, they were not governed by, did they just have 500 employees per location? So some of these places were able to qualify, even though they really are big companies or there's affiliation rules that uh, mean that they're, they may be backed by big companies um, and they still, got, they still got their loans. And so that, that's what hit the news. And I think that's you know, what I said to somebody is that Shake Shack kind of shook the administration up and <laughs> made them much more attentive to, oh gosh, we've got to take a closer look at these loans. And I, I think yes, in yesterday or Monday's paper, there was already reports of law enforcement going after um, companies on the mainland who made certain um, attestations to their eligibility, but it turns out that they were misrepresenting. So mm. more enforcement actions. Yeah, well, I think, you know, this is what happens when, as in the Tax Reform Act of 2017, when you, when you don't have hearings, when it's all written in the back room and quickly, um, and, you know, anything goes, and that's what happened with this bill, except that, you know, 2.3 trillion is as big as it gets so far uh, yeah. so you, you have I mistakes think, made in the drafting and otherwise right i mean i think the intention was good the intention was to help these poor businesses that are just suffering so badly because of the stay home orders and the like but um and i think you know what i've heard is that the sba was encouraging lenders to be very flexible and broad in the application uh, or their review of applications um, in order to benefit as many businesses as possible and then what happened in that rush is, you know, in the meantime, regulations were being written and, you know, they tried to keep up with the, the flow and it was all happening at the same time and clarifications were happening after loans were submitted or granted. So it's just, it's been a confusing process, but I, I think the initial, the initial motivation was good. Mm -hmm. The has been problematic. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess uh, one last question on all of that is, um, is it achieving what it was intended to do? Uh, we, we had a, an economy, a, a, an unprecedented um, uh, event in the economy that stopped everything suddenly. Uh, is it doing what it was supposed to do? Well, um, I guess that remains to be seen because some of the funding has just started to come through. But I, I think that for a lot of businesses who have received these loans, it's going to be very important for them to enable them to pay their employees, to be able to keep employees um, you know, on payroll and to kind of give a, a jump start to their businesses as uh, all these uh, businesses and organizations face reopening what, what that's going to look like. Yeah. Well, one of the considerations, of course, is how, how long can you keep on doing this? We had tranche number two and query, can we do tranche number three, four, five, six, seven uh, um, without, without a real uh, opening of the economy? Uh, one other thing before we leave this topic is, um, is my check. Where, where is my check? I don't see my check. I don't know if you've seen your check. And how about unemployment uh, compensation? Where is that? Uh, just just uh, if, if you could just update us on what's happening with that. Yeah. Um, well, I haven't seen my check either. I'm not even sure I'm going to get a check because I believe there were income limits um, on, you know, who would qualify. But supposedly, um, you know, those who had uh, bank accounts that IRS could uh, access or, or had the numbers for, they're supposed to be getting their checks um, in their accounts. And I guess there were some... Um, people who, if they hadn't filed tax returns or weren't in the IRS's database, are going to have to file something to get their checks. Mm -hmm. Hopefully those checks are coming, but, uh, you know, that'll be a nice, a nice one-time boost, but it's certainly not going to cover every, all the needs that um, people have. And as for unemployment, um, what the, it was, what, what the federal legislation did do is it added $600, um, extra to unemployment benefits. And so people, um, you know, have started, those who are unemployed have started to get that. Benefit. Um, although I've read in the paper that sometimes what that means is that the benefit is better than the pay they actually get at work. And so when some of our local companies are, are starting to, you know, get up to speed or reopen again, uh, they're having problems sometimes getting their employees to come back. 
not to mention that there's the whole issue of workplace safety and how safe is one going to be when they go back to work. Yeah, I, yeah, I certainly I want to go to that. But what's interesting is a lot of people, mm, you know, they, they will see the workplace as dangerous. Uh, they will n not be so quick to drop their social distancing and masks and the like. Um, they won't go back. They'll say, I'd rather live. I'd rather my family live than take a risk of going back because I don't have any level of confidence that the uh, administration in Washington has protected the workplace or anyone else has protected the workplace. Um, so I'm staying home. Do me. I'm staying home. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of people do that. If they actually, if they can afford to do that, a lot of people will do that. And then you have an economic problem, no? Yeah, I think so. We're, probably, we're already seeing that with some of the states that have, uh, you know, where the governors have relaxed the stay at home orders and allowed businesses to open. Not all businesses are opening, um, it's being reported. And I think, you know, for our employers here in Hawaii, um, the issue is going to be, you know, how do I keep my employees safe and, uh, you know, prevent further disruption? Uh, from a second wave if there's, you know, if there's an in, uh, infection in the workplace. Um, and then on the other side, employees who are going to be reluctant to come back to work until they know that safety measures have been taken. So I think that means we're going to be seeing um, a different workplace than what we left, those of us who left, uh, to do work remotely. And it's yeah. of masks as a way of life and more social distancing and be even a combination of remote work and in-office work continuing for a while. Yeah, I noticed you didn't even mention shaking hands. You oh, know, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in all of, you know, human society, shaking hands, uh, well, most of it anyway, shaking hands is part of, um, it's a greeting. It's a, I, I don't have a weapon with me. I, I mean you well. Um, and on the way out, I, you know, I'm glad we had this meeting and uh, I wish you well until we meet again. I mean, it's, it has all kinds of implications, but that's over. <laughs> Hard to do a business meeting, actually. I always think about, shouldn't I, shouldn't I shake his hand or her hand? Or shouldn't I say hello, goodbye that way? Um, but I think, as, as you suggest, it's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think along with social distancing is going to be new ways to greet each other socially too. Um, so that's going to be interesting. Yeah. I remember so tell, being in a grocery store recently and seeing somebody I knew and, you know, your natural urge is to get closer to them and talk, but they didn't do that. I realized, oh, we're supposed to be socially distancing. So we're all still getting used to that new normal. Yeah. I, I walk in my neighborhood, you got to get some exercise, you know, and I, and I see people there across the street, they're 20 feet away or more. And uh, I, want to, I want to say hello. I want to share. I want to ask them how they're doing. You know, fundamental human interaction. Can't do it. And they, and they look down the street. They, 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 avoid, they avoid conversation. And so I've learned to avoid conversation. It's really tragic in terms of the human experience. But let's talk about the workplace because this is going to change the workplace. It is changing the workplace. It's changing it, you know, de facto, but it's also changing it legally. Can you describe to me the workplace as it is changing and, and how it will be when we, I shouldn't say come out of this because I have no high hopes we're going to come out of this, you know, uh, at any time soon. Well, that's, a, you know, that's an issue that is still in the process of invention and in reimagining by all of us, you know, empl employers as well as lawyers. Um, I think, uh, you know, for, from the legal side, what we, you know, maybe the starting point is where the starting point was when we first started learning about this whole pandemic and how to respond to it, which is to look to guidance from the CDC, go to their website, uh, the Department of, our local Department of Health, as well as the federal OSHA, Occupational Safety, Safe and <laughs> Occupational Safety Agency, and uh, as well as EEOC, the Equal Opportunity, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, because all of those websites have guidance on what employers are supposed to do. And that's going to sort of be the legal framework um, under which we all return to work. Um, and that involves, uh, you know, based on those various websites, assessing the risk 
in terms of, okay, is this a workplace where you're gonna have a high amount of interaction either among workers or customers? And if so, you know, what kind of protections need to be put in place? And you know, OSHA, for instance, has a, and CDC have a host of guidelines on how to maintain a safe and hygienic workplace, um, what you know, employees need to do for personal, um, you know, personal hygiene, and then uh, what you should do if employees are sick or there is, uh, you know, have symptoms, which is still is the rule is you've got to stay home. They've got to report in, they can't come to work and sort of power through because they need to get the work done. They, if you're sick, you need to stay home to prevent infection. And we have seen how some of uh, the clusters that we've had even here in our state have arisen from people coming to work sick. Probably mm -hmm. they either could, you know, couldn't afford to stay home or they felt like they needed to do the job. Yeah, I'm reminded, uh, I'm, try I'm trying to analyze the meat packing. Uh, Rachel Maddow talked about it in the last couple of days. Very interesting how this huge percentage of people working in these meatpacking plants in little towns where it's the only job available. And you know, a thousand people working in a meatpacking plant and more than half of them are, are sick. So why is that? Uh, there's got to be a, a physical biomedical reason for that. And I would guess is that it's, it's physical work. And while you do physical work, you're going to breathe harder. And if you're in close proximity to the person near you, you're going to breathe in that person's direction. And, and the virus particles uh, are micro, micro uh, droplets and they go in all directions. As a result, everybody in the plant is sick. And so that kind of circumstance is more dangerous than in an office that has, for example, partitions and separate offices uh, where people don't necessarily do physical work. They don't breathe hard. Uh, although I suppose you can get emotional and breathe hard <laughs> from that point of view. But, but I, you know, what I'm saying is different strokes for different folks for different businesses. And it seems to me, if I'm a CEO of a company, a Hawaii company, uh, where I want to protect my, my employees going forward, I want to offer them safety uh, to return. Um, I would come, and, and I'm not pushing legal practice here, but I would come to a lawyer because there are so many regulations, so many sources, so many confusions. And as you say, you know, the, right now, all these regulations are dynamic. They could change as soon as you look away. And then I would come to a lawyer like you and I would say, you know, what do I do now? How do I change my plan? Do I put plastic, you know, dividers between, between staff members? Uh, do I change my air conditioning system? I want them to be safe. I'm willing to spend the money because I want them back. Um, am I right about that? The best source of all these varying regulations, changing regulations, is going to be somebody like a lawyer. No? Well, Jay, um, of course, it's a little, you know, us being both lawyers, we, you know, we might be a little biased, but I think that's very true because we know where to look uh, for the, the relevant regulations. And one of the great things that I'm really happy that our office, our firm did um, nationwide and globally early on was to form a pandemic special situations team. And um, I, was a, I was a member, have been a member of the team and it's been a really interesting, a good opportunity to see, to work across offices and cross disciplines, um, you know, to be able to serve our clients by combining our resources and knowledge. And uh, I tell you that's been keeping us really busy because um, the issues that have faced employers have just been changing constantly. Um, you know, there's always some basics that remain, but uh, you know, the, the basics have been just needing to keep constantly monitoring this array of federal and state agencies that have, uh, you know, uh, added coronavirus type of regulations. And as I mentioned, that's the CDC and OSHA and EEOC and our, our own Department of Health um, I, you know, even go to the governor's website to check on what the latest proclamations are. Um, and so law is a very essential part of making sure that um, employers not only are legally compliant, but also are, you know, give their employees the assurance of knowing that they are, they have the employee's interests in mind and they're keeping a safe workplace. Yeah, well, I mean, but that's, that's more than just a matter of advice to the managers. There's other implications. I mean, for example, uh, if um, I'm thinking loosely, but uh, if the employer doesn't care about that, doesn't get counsel on it, doesn't look at the regulations, and he winds up with a shop full of sick people, 
who uh, suffer, um, who die. Um, that sounds like a pretty good tort claim to me, don't you think? Well, um, that you know, that's probably the next one of the other next areas, and uh, I'm seeing that in the advertisements for uh, continuing legal ed. But it's going to be the issue of okay, what kind of liability and litigation is going to arise of this, arise out of this, and what kind of maybe inaction or whatever by the employer is going to could give rise to liability on the employer side. So yeah, we're probably going to see more of that as well as uh, as things are settling down and uh, you know we see the the ongoing ramifications of the COVID pandemic. pandemic. Yeah, by the same token, uh, an employee um, who gets terminated for failure to come in when the employer is saying, look, I made it safe. I followed all the regulations. I did everything I could do. I'm prudent. Look at me. I'm prudent. Um, and you refuse to come in because your perception of this is this riskier than I think it is. I'm terminating you. And the question, of course, is raised because there's a contention there. Is that a, is that a wrongful termination? Uh, it could be a significant job, a significant damage. It could be in a, in a market that's so strange like this one, a lot of damages result from that termination. Um, don't you think that's going to happen if it isn't oh, already yeah. happening? Yeah, I mean, that was an issue that probably, you know, was there at the very beginning among HR people too. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. what you do um, if you've done, if you've taken all the steps needed according to the CDC and OSHA, uh, you know, to maintain a safe workplace and still the employee is afraid to come in. You know, they're afraid of someone who maybe traveled or has been exposed or actually got sick. Um, and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen how that plays out. But, but I think that uh, what it, the lesson for employers is that one, the importance of compliance. Second, the importance of communication and educating everyone from top down on, you know, what is a safe workplace, what needs to be done. Um, and making sure that, you know, the education comes from the employer so that there's not fake information out there that people access that get them all concerned. And ultimately, if, you know, the employer has done all of those actions and uh, an employee still unreasonably refuses to come in, you know, that could, you know, that could well be the basis for termination or um, a discipline. Interestingly note, though, at least, at least during, you know, all of the, the pandemic period, if you go to the CDC website, which does have guidances for businesses, um, they have often been urging that employers be flexible during this period, just because, you know, there's still things that we're learning about the disease and how contagious it is. So, I, you know, I think in general, employers have been uh, trying to be understanding, but there will be a point in time when they need to reopen, get back to business. Um, and then I think the education and communication piece is going to be very important. Yeah, yeah, we have much to learn about this. I mean, not only on the biochemical level, but on the human relations level and on the law, the legal side level. You know, for example, you know, I see, I see businesses as hubs in a wheel and the spokes lead out to a million possible collaborators. There's suppliers, there's customers, there's consultants, there's professionals, all kinds helping that business deal with the modern world. I mean, up till, up till January anyway. Uh, but now you wanna hire somebody, um, maybe you have to look more carefully at, at what force majeure really means. Uh, you wanna be sure that there's something in there, pro or con, however you see the, you know, the way it cuts, uh, about epidemics and pandemics. Uh, I'm sure you, you must have some contact with, I'm sure there's a lot of contracts where, where people who are parties to that contract wished they would have changed the words if they knew this was going to happen. It would have been different provision about force majeure and epidemics and pandemics. And I think going forward, there'll be more care about that, par that paragraph, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I think we're learning as we go. And uh, that first force majeure has been a big issue. Um, during this pandemic, uh, because oftentimes, well, there's all kinds of clauses and they're not always all labeled force majeure, but uh, the whole idea of what excuses you from contract uh, performance, um, it differs by contract. And sometimes it may include a epidemic or pandemic provision and more often apparently, you know, it does not. Um, it might relate to government orders and, and the like. Um, you, you know, one of I think probably from a business standpoint, uh, maybe the first 
action isn't to isn't to litigate or say I'm not going to do this, but the counseling has been to reach out to the other side and you know try to work out a business solution um, because even if performance can't be done now, you know maybe there's a reason to continue the business relation in another way in the future. Hopefully, when we all emerge from the other side of this pandemic. Yeah, that's very profound because that what that means is that business relationships will change. Business entities will change the way they form up and the way they connect and the way they act as hubs or not hubs in a given enterprise. It's very interesting. You know, I don't remember the exact circumstance, but I remember your firm got to certify compliance with some with some rules that had uh, been promulgated by the state in connection with uh, in connection with uh, the inspection of uh, condo properties. This was years ago. And um, you may be too young to remember this, um, but it seems to me it's like a leads inspection. Um, so if I if I come to your place of business and I inspect your place of business, then I look at the partitions, I look at the policies, I look at the I don't know the air conditioning, um, I look at uh, you know the sick leave arrangements, the insurance arrangements, all that stuff, um, and I certify you. I, I, I take a look at what you're doing and I say, you qualify, we give you three stars or four stars or five stars as a compliant organization. And so when people are thinking about working with you, uh, when contractors are thinking about contracting with you, you know, suppliers, partners, what have you, they know that you have five stars and you're relatively, not guaranteed, but relatively safe. What do you think about that for a business idea going forward? Well, I think that that's a, that's a very interesting and probably potentially useful business idea. And I think it goes to the point that we're probably going to see a lot of different new types of business models and service models coming out of this pandemic. Um, you know, for instance, just disaster planning is going to take a whole new meaning because now we've seen that disasters really can happen and can have a profound effect. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, for instance, the gig economy there's a lot more attention going to be paid to, you know, the Uber style or the Lyft style of service where you need people to provide services to you door to door, um, business to business. Um, this whole certification, I have a feeling the companies who got in there and, and figured out how they should be doing deep cleaning, uh, say for instance, in a, a lodging and accommodation situation. Um, you know, they're going to be um, getting more business. Costco, certainly, they're certain, <laughs> certainly doing quite well in this economy. And um, yeah, uh, business, uh, businesses like that, I think, you know, some of us lawyers have been very busy too, uh, just giving advice on just how to navigate this whole uncertain arena. Yeah. And, and one of the things, of course, everybody talks about the change in the workplace um, to allow working at home, because we have all learned so much about about Zoom. Look at that beautiful background you have. Uh, I My mean, cousin's a lot of painting. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give a pitch to Doug Young. <laughs> okay. You know, we, I had one uh, fellow yesterday. He went out and bought a green screen for his house. <laughs> so this is happening all over the place, and they want to, you know, they want to be part of, um, you know, the new the new model about talking comfortably uh, on Zoom or other. Cisco, Web Direct, whatever it is, WebEx. Um, so, you know, the question is, uh, where is that going to fit in the workplace going forward? Not everybody can effectively work at home. Some yes. people, you know, there has to be a division, a dichotomy between those that can and want to and are equally efficient that way and those who really have to be physically present. How do you see that unfolding in the workplace and, and the way the workplace is organized, the legal structure around it? Well, I think that um, for one thing, businesses are going to need to be more nimble and um, attentive to their particular situation. Um, you know, I was just making some notes because early on, I took some notes at the very beginning of this pandemic on what employers should be doing, which is to calibrate responses and uh, respond appropriately, achieve balance. You know, would this health crisis become an economic crisis? It certainly has. But, um, you know, I think that's still, uh, you know, to sort of be resilient and um, maybe be able to pivot in this new environment means a lot more, uh, you know, kind of looking, really taking a good look at how things work. And it might mean that from the future on, we may indeed have more remote or flexible working arrangements. Um, and each business is going to have to decide how it can best function 
um, between remote and in office and a safe in office environment. Um, and then there's that whole issue too of how are you gonna manage a remote workforce and how to effectively manage that. That's another thing I have to give our firm kudos to because we've had a lot of phone calls and virtual conferences and sometimes it, we say, well, another one, but actually that communication um, has is really important when we have a remote workforce to be able to see each other even virtually um, is a way of maintaining and keeping employees engaged. So I think we're all going to be having to figure out new ways um, to um, engage our uh, employees and with, with colleagues and, and to manage a very different work environment. Yeah, and, and memorialize it. I mean, it's a little scary to think that if anybody wants to record a, a Zoom call, a Zoom conference, they can do that. And that, and that is forever. And so, you know, it's, if you wondered whether it was on the record before, now you know it's on the record now. Um, the, other, the other thing, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we talk about everybody working together. We we're all in this together. Well, it isn't only the employee at home or in the, in the office, as the case may be, in a new environment, in a new paradigm. It isn't, it's the employer, of course. Legally, the employer has a greater responsibility and accountability, uh, you know, to, to the public and to employees and, and gig employees included. Uh, and so then, then you get, well, wait a minute. This is going back to, I guess, um, the 80s, maybe, or the early 90s, when mainland companies, and Glen Hawaii companies, too, decided that they could do more with fewer people, that they, they didn't need 10,000 square feet of space in a downtown office building. They could get along with 2,000 square feet of space in a downtown office building. And as one of our guests not too long ago pointed out, well, that's going to happen again, because if I decide that some of my employees, my staff can be at home uh, and doesn't, they don't have to come in at all. I don't want them in and all. So I need less square footage. So the next time that lease gets a chance to be reopened, okay, they're gonna say to the landlord who's got hundreds of millions invested in this big property, they're gonna say, we don't, we don't need all this space. We're a very good company making money and doing the right thing, but we need maybe a quarter of the space we used to need somebody is going to be under big pressure. This is one of those elements, I think, in the reopening that we have yet to see play out. But there will be a change in, what do you want to call it, investment in space, don't you think? And there'll be legal friction about that, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, I think you've hit it on the head, um, Jay. I, I think that probably there are going to be a lot of companies and firms and organizations looking at their space requirements in light of what we've all been through. Um, and, you know, that gets into the whole area of, okay, then, right, how do you revisit contracts or renegotiate? Um, I think the next area we're going to see, too, is just commercial real estate um, and, and, you know, landlord and tenant relations and, and how those are all going to be worked out as everybody figures out what the new business is going to look like. Mm. Exciting, but time for innovation. Now, you had, you had, you gave a, a talk to the Bar Association a few weeks ago, which was, well, well received and uh, well appreciated. Um, and then you made a, an outline that went on for quite some time in preparation for this discussion. Uh, and we, I'm sure we have not covered it all, but I wanna, I wanna give you one last minute, Louise, to, to say what you'd like to leave with people, what we might've missed and what you would like them to think about going forward in terms of the, you know, the new workplace and how, how the, the law of COVID comes to the law of the workplace. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jay. Yeah, parting thoughts. Well, I've been, I, I, to me, the, the new bywords um, are that, uh, you know, it's not, we're only not talking about reopening, but let's really rethink how we do business and, uh, you know, what is the, what revitalization and sustainability is going to look like. We've seen that in the Sunday article about transforming tourism. Let's rethink how that's going to look and let's try to be better about it. I think I had sent you a, uh, a nice little YouTube piece that was on the news the other day of, called The Realization. Yes. Um, it was a lovely piece about how this is this pandemic which is giving us an opportunity to kind of do things better. So I hope we, that we you, use the next or define the next new normal in a way that we do things better and we don't mess things up. How's that? Okay, can we check back with you from time to time to find out how it's going? 
yeah, I think we should check back in and see how, how it's going and calibrate and make sure that we are on the right path. All right, Louise, thank you so much. Thanks for coming down. Really appreciate Thanks, it. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Wash your hands. Yes. <laughs>